funny little free thing with balls on it up there it has to do with this white Halloween that we recently had. Uh, greenhouse gases and global weirding are actually very strongly connected. Uh, uh, you, may, you may well know that the past two years have been years of extreme weather. Um, what do I mean by extreme weather? Well, extreme weather uh, are events like the, the flooding in Tennessee uh, last summer. Tennessee received more rainfall than it ever has on record, and the floods were um, the sorts of floods that are expected once every thousand years. So these are one in a thousand year floods in Tennessee. This is the uh, symphony place in Nashville flooded out. Um, uh, there was also, on the flip side, in Moscow, a, a tremendous heat wave. It was the deadliest heat wave in the world on record. Um, Moscow experienced temperatures in June, July, and August that completely shattered previous records uh, last summer. Um, uh, last year also, Australia received terrible flooding. Um, and ter uh, extremely large parts of Australia were flooded out. The flooding was so bad that you might have heard about this in the news. There is now a, uh, a golf course where one of the water hazards has sharks in it because the sharks were washed into the golf course from the ocean. And this is not a golf course on the coast. It's miles and miles away from the ocean. The flooding was so bad that sharks actually were brought to the golf course, and now the water has really is a hazard. <laughs> There's an airplane there? This is, this is a runway. There's an airplane taking off from the runway. Oh. This part of the runway was not flooded. That part was. Wow. It's like um, and this is, again, this is 100 miles from the ocean. It's like, a pol it's like the polar bear on the ice floe. Yeah. Floating away. Can't get away. Um, you, there were also terrible fires throughout Texas this summer. Uh, Texas and, in fact, the entire southwest U.S. has been experiencing drought conditions for basically the past decade. Um, and, in fact, uh, October of 2010 through September of 2011 were the driest 12 months on record in Texas. Um, and they, they received a bit of rain this October, which helped uh, reduce fires, but uh, you probably heard wildfires all, all throughout Texas. Austin was threatened by wildfires. Um, also, uh, last year, Pakistan experienced the most expensive natural disaster in Pakistan's history with flooding covering an area the size of England. Uh, and, and then, coming a little closer to home, you probably remember just, just a month ago, we had 700,000 people without power when we received, when Connecticut received many inches of snow, ranging from I think about six inches here in New Haven to eight inches even a foot in some other parts of the state. Uh, Vermont received two feet of snow on October, October 31st on Halloween. Uh, so, so this is the weird weather that we've been experiencing, um, and uh, this is actually strongly connected to greenhouse gases greenhouse effect and global warming, um, but uh, I need to, I'm, in order to make that link, I'm going to go through a bit of physics and a bit of chemistry to explain how the greenhouse effect actually works. Uh, so so this, is, this is going to be a, a relatively simple discussion. Um, I'm not going to go through radiative transfer physics and how uh, water vapor responds exactly to changes in temperature forcings, but, but hopefully by the end of this you'll, you'll have a nice picture in your mind of exactly how the greenhouse, of how the greenhouse effect works. Um, the executive summary, the, the point to take away from the next several slides, if you don't learn anything else, is that the surface of the Earth is warmer than it would be in the absence of an atmosphere because it receives heat from two different things, the sun and the atmosphere. So, when, when we're talking about uh, the greenhouse effect, we always start with where we get our heat from. The first primary source of our heat, which is the sun. So, solar radiation powers the climate system. Light from the sun uh, reaches the earth. Some of the light from the sun is reflected by the atmosphere. Some of it is absorbed by the atmosphere. Some of it is reflected by the surface of the earth. Ice is shiny, water is shiny. Some of it is absorbed by the surface of the earth. Uh, uh, ground and plants actually absorb heat quite well. Uh, about half of the solar radiation uh, 
that reaches the Earth is absorbed by the Earth's surface and warms it. Well, warm things, just the sun is hot, and that's why it's producing light. Warm things produce light uh, and heat, and so the Earth's surface radiates that heat away. And um, if the atmosphere wasn't there, the, the only warmth we would have would be whatever energy we're getting from the sun. But some of the energy that the Earth is radiating away gets caught by certain molecules in the atmosphere. Not all of them, just some. And they absorb that infrared radiation, that heat, and prevent it from radiating away into space. And so the greenhouse effect is that trapping of infrared radiation, of heat, by specific molecules in the atmosphere, preventing them from radiating away into space. Now, I say there's specific molecules in the atmosphere. Most of our atmosphere is made up of nitrogen and oxygen. It's about 70% nitrogen, about 25% oxygen. But oxygen and nitrogen are not greenhouse gases. So, first quiz for the audience, and uh, at least two of you are not allowed to answer. <laughs> What's the difference between the things on this side and the things on this side? What, what, what's different about them? Thank you. 
put those above the atmosphere because all that water is sucking away those particular wavelengths of light. So this is what, this red region is what the Earth absorbs. So the Earth absorbs this light, it warms up, and it re-radiates. It, it produces heat. Uh, okay, not, not a lot of heat, but it produces heat. Uh, and that heat that the Earth produces is appro approximately this blue curve here. So a warm body, just like the sun, produces light with a certain pattern. And if th there wasn't an atmosphere, the Earth would be between 200 and 300 degrees Kelvin. So that's about, so, so 310 is minus, um, minus 40 degrees uh, Celsius, or minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit. That's a, that's a useful number because they're the same. Uh, the blue region is how much of Earth's radiated heat actually makes it into space. So by the same token, light coming from the sun gets absorbed, so only a certain amount of it gets to the Earth's surface. Light coming off, radiation coming off of the Earth, heat coming off of the Earth gets absorbed, so only a certain amount of it makes it out. 70% of the light coming from the sun makes it to the Earth's surface. 30% of the light coming from the sun is absorbed by the atmosphere. Exactly the opposite is true for, for uh, heat coming off of the Earth. 70% of the heat coming off of the Earth is absorbed by the atmosphere. 30% of it makes it into space. And so you can see, you can actually, if you, if you look, this is the total amount of absorption at various wavelengths in the infrared, in the visible, and in the UV that our atmosphere produces. So out here in the, in the ultraviolet, all of the light gets, gets absorbed. Out here in the far infrared, all of the light gets absorbed. In some of these other wavelengths of light, various pockets get absorbed and various pockets are free to make it out into space or to reach the Earth's surface. And these, these pockets are useful from, astronomy perspective, from an astronomy perspective because we can build a telescope to observe in what's called these atmospheric windows where most of the light still gets through and doesn't get absorbed. But all of this absorption is being produced by water vapor, carbon dioxide, a little bit by ozone, and a little bit by oxygen, a little bit by methane, some by nitrous oxide. So I, I showed these on the slides before, carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, water vapor. Those are the greenhouse gases. And, and I said they can absorb heat because they have all those different ways to vibrate. Well, that's reflected in where, what wavelengths of light they're allowed to absorb. Uh, and one, another, another fun takeaway fact for you is if anyone asks you why the sky is blue, you can answer rally scattering. Rally scattering is, is blue light preferentially being reflected and bounced around in the atmosphere instead of red light. And you can see that here, blue light is, is being absorbed and reflected, red light isn't. So this is, this is why the sky is blue. Ozone is why we don't get skin cancer, or we get less skin cancer than we would otherwise because of UV. And water vapor, carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide are what trap heat in the atmosphere. So uh, over the history of Earth's, of Earth's climate, uh, we have, there has been a, a flux of these various molecules between the atmosphere and the ground, between the atmosphere and the ocean. Uh, for most of Earth's history, there's been a relative balance. About as much carbon dioxide gets absorbed by plants as the plants release when they, when they decay. Uh, so, but in recent times, something's changed. What's changed is that we've been digging up fossil fuels. We've been digging up dead and buried plants that have that died and sank into the mud or died and sank down to the bottom of the ocean and got com compressed and turned into coal and natural gas and oil. And when we burn them, we release carbon dioxide into the atmosphere that has been trapped and sequestered away underground. And we're actually, um, this burning has caused drama a dramatic increase in the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. I said before, CO2 is a greenhouse gas. You saw. CO2 absorbs infrared radiation in certain bands. And 
so if we put more CO2 into the atmosphere, that's going to mean that the atmosphere can absorb more of that heat and prevent it from getting away into space. And that means that the temperature of the planet is going to increase. And historically, over the past thousand years, until the Industrial Revolution, the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere has been relatively constant. Now, uh, back around the time of, of Galileo and Columbus and, and the, the Scientific Revolution and the Dark Ages and uh, uh, Camelot back here, we didn't have uh, uh, probes in, sticking out in the atmosphere that we could use to measure CO2. But we can, we can estimate the amount of CO2 that was in the atmosphere back in this time by doing things like measuring the uh, amount of CO2 in bubbles trapped in Antarctic ice. So, so we have proxies to estimate how much CO2 there was back before we could actually measure it. And we can use those proxies to go back hundreds of thousands of years. And so during the, the ice ages, we found that there's significantly less CO2 in the atmosphere. Well, that makes sense. If there's less CO2 in the atmosphere, the planet is going to not be as warm. So that means more ice will form, glaciers will advance. Uh, on the other hand, between the ice ages, like we are now, we're between, we're, we're between the ice ages, the planet's warmer, and so the, glacier, the glaciers retreat, the sea level rises. Well, now we can increase the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere from about 280 parts per million so 0.0002% to 390 is actually the, the latest value for this year. So, so 0.0039%. Um, and that actually has a measurable effect. Uh, we, can, we can model this. So, so um, the discussion I've given so far is kind of at the level of the computer models in the 70s and before. Uh, there's, there's a simple atmosphere with CO2 in it, sunlight comes down, and in fact, uh, one other thing that happens, a warmer atmosphere, a warmer air can hold more water vapor, and as I said before, water vapor is a greenhouse gas, so you get a bit of an amplification, and you have to include that in your models. Uh, in the mid-80s, computers got faster, climate models got more advanced, and so they started including things like how the ice changes as the temperature warms up or gets colder. Uh, they included the land surface, and they included a bit of the carbon cycle. And the models in the 80s were the ones that, that uh, climate scientist James Hansen used when he gave a testimony in Congress in 1988, which was sort of the first real wake-up call about climate change and global warming. Uh, he, he testified to Congress based on the models that he had run then, saying that if we, don't, if, if we don't stop burning fossil fuels, the temperature of the Earth is going to increase dramatically. Uh, the FAR, SAR, TAR, and AR4 are subsequent international panel on climate change models. Each, each one produced about uh, six years apart. Uh, and each of the models has more sophisticated elements in it. Uh, an ocean, a, a very basic ocean, an ocean where you actually have some overturning so that deep parts of the ocean can transmit heat to upper parts of the ocean. Uh, more complicated land with rivers and interactive vegetation where the vegetation changes as the temperature and the water cycle changes. Um, aerosols and sulfates are what you might, are, are what you would call smog. Smog actually is, is a very complicated thing. It reflects light away when it's high up in the atmosphere and actually cools the Earth. But it also traps heat from getting out. So, so in, incorporating aerosols in climate models is a very tricky thing. Um, uh, and I'm going, to talk about, I'm going to talk about aerosols a little bit in the future. One of the things in, that the US has done over the past several decades is we've had stronger laws about air pollution, which have reduced the amount of smog that they've produced. But that means that that one aspect of the climate system in the U.S. has gone away, mostly. Uh, so, so the summary so far is that the climate changes when it's given a nudge, 
and we're giving it a big nudge. The nudge is the increase in CO2, the increased carbon dioxide that we're putting in the atmosphere, the increased greenhouse gases, and the Earth responds to changes in the atmospheric composition, changes in greenhouse gas, gases in the atmosphere. So, so this is the temperature of the Earth as measured in, in recent times, and this is going back a thousand years. And recent temperatures are unprecedented in the past thousand years, because as you can see, CO2, and remember the sun, how the sun changes, the sun has cycles, we have to incorporate that. And aerosols, smog, we have to incorporate that. Those are sort of the three most important pieces of, of, the, climate, of the, uh, the climate system. Uh, those have all been relatively unchanged over the last thousand years. And the temperature has been relatively unchanged over the past thousand years. But the temperatures of, of the recent past, the recent few decades, are unprecedented in the last thousand years. They're likely unprecedented in the past 2,000 years. And they are probably unprecedented in the past 6,000 years. So, so this, this little change here, which, which is only an increase in temperature of 0.8 degrees Celsius, which is one and a half degrees Fahrenheit, is, it has put us into a completely new regime compared to any time in recorded history. And this is what... I have a question for you. You have yes. a slide back before that had the CO2 level and you had some cycles that were... The we, we can talk about that at the end. Okay. Uh, uh, I, I've had to cut things for time. Okay. Um, so so, uh, so this, this small change, one and a half degrees Fahrenheit, has resulted in what some are calling the new normal. Average temperatures are no longer average if you're thinking about what the average was several decades ago. Uh, what does this mean? Well, this means there have been more record highs than record lows in the past decade. The 2000s had twice as many record highs as record lows. Global warming doesn't mean that everything will be warmer all the time forever, but it means that, there, that you're, you're more likely to have a record high than you are to have a record low. And you might notice something in here. During the 60s and 70s, there were actually more record lows than record highs. That's for two reasons. One, uh, back uh, a few decades ago, the sun wasn't producing quite as much light as it is now, by a very tiny fraction of a percent, but that's enough to push temperatures a little bit lower. Also, what was happening during the 50s, 60s, and 70s, we were burning a lot of really unclean um, fossil fuels. We were burning coal without scrubbers on the coal plants. We were burning leaded gasoline in very inefficient engines. That produced a lot of smog. I said earlier, smog can trap heat. Well, that's, that's the other reason why, during this time frame in the United States, there were a little bit more record lows than record highs. We've cleaned up our act in that regard, so now the smog has faded away, which, which has let the signal from the, the increased greenhouse gases take over. So this is in the US. I mentioned earlier the Russian heat wave. The Russian heat wave was unprecedented. June, July, and August temperatures were about 7 degrees warmer than average June, July, and August temperatures. And they were warmer than at any time in Russia's uh, temperature record, which goes back about 200 years. Uh, and if, if you, if uh, some recent, very recent publications on um, the link between Russia's heat wave and climate change have shown that uh, the Russian heat wave was about a one in a 300 year type of event under normal conditions. Well, I said, we're in a new normal now. Uh, so now, under current conditions, this type of heat wave in Russia is the sort of thing you'd expect every couple decades. And later in the century, it's the sort of thing that you, will, you would expect every other year is a heat wave of this, press, of, of this magnitude. Uh, the, this heat wave, was three to five times more likely to occur in the 2000s because of the warmer temperatures we have now than it was in the 80s because it was cooler then. Global warming also means not only more heat waves, but more droughts and floods. 
Droughts and floods are the sorts of things that insurance agencies worry about. Because if a farmer can't grow as much food as he was expecting to grow, he's going to get an insurance payout. Uh, uh, if, if a house gets washed away because of terrible flooding, uh, they're going to, you know, the insurance company is going to have to pay, pay out on the insurance. Munich Re is, one, is a massive, multi-billion dollar reinsurance company. And they have to keep track of these things because if they don't keep good track of how many um, how many events, how many how many insurance payout events there are, they're not going to be able to uh, stay in business. Um, so, 2010 was a record year, far and away, not just for cost. It was a record year for cost, but it was a record year for number of insurance events. So this is broken down by meteorological storm, that's in green, climatological, that's temperature extremes like the Russian heat wave here in, here in yellow, and hydrological, that's floods, um, mass movements of people because they, they were dislocated from where, they, from where they lived, here in blue, and geophysical, earthquakes, tsunamis, volcanic activity. Well, geophysical events don't have anything to do with, with the climate with greenhouse gases. They haven't really changed over time. What has changed significantly are major storms and temperature extremes. Uh, and uh, in the Washington Post, actually, just, just in November, uh, Charlene Lurig, who is the senior manager of the insurance program at the Investors Group Series, said that the fact that 2011, which is not on this chart, ranked as the most expensive year in insurance industry history will mean that consumers, you and I, will have to pay more for insurance. So, so this, this not only does, does uh, global warming produce weird weather, but it also affects how much you pay for insurance. So that's, that's what has happened. So let's talk a little bit about where we're going. Under business as usual, assuming we don't do any major pushes to replace coal plants, uh, put up solar panels, we, assuming we don't do any major pushes to change how we're altering the, the amount of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, what's going to happen? So who here likes maple syrup? Everybody. I love maple syrup. Maple syrup production in Vermont and New Hampshire are severely threatened under if the planet warms up because maple trees need a, a certain number of days below freezing in order to produce sap. And we're just getting to the point where, uh, where temperatures in the northeast are warm enough that that's just starting to have a measurable effect. But within a few decades, you probably won't, it might be very hard to get Vermont maple syrup. You might have to get Quebec maple syrup. So, uh, who liked lobster? I, I'm not a big fan of lobster, but it's a popular thing. I, I, I come from the Midwest. We don't have lobsters out there. Lobster production is temperature dependent. Lobsters actually get sick. There are certain diseases that affect lobsters more strongly when the water is warmer than when it's colder. So, as the earth warms, lobster production will shift northward out of Massachusetts and New Hampshire and Maine, and in further north into Canada. So again, those darn Canadians will be taking not only our maple syrup, but our lobsters too. Okay, does anyone here ski? Ah, oh, no skiers. This is going to be a big one. I thought everyone over here. I skied once and I ended up flying through the air and landing on my face. Uh, uh, by the end of the century, in a business as usual scenario, if we keep doing things the way we're doing, the ski season will be cut in half in Vermont, New Hampshire, and Maine, and northern New York, and reduced to just a week or two in Connecticut and Massachusetts. Uh, skiing obviously needs a significant amount of snow and low enough temperatures for that snow to stick around. Well, there will be more water vapor in the atmosphere, so we'll have more snow again, but it'll melt. It won't stick around long enough for ski skiing to work well. And finally, 
uh, temperatures will increase. As I already said, record highs are out, outstripping record lows. Under a business as usual scenario later in this century, Hartford, Philly, and Boston can expect to have 30 days over 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Let's break that down a little bit. So, so here's the number of days per year on average between 1961 and 1990 that were over 90 degrees Fahrenheit. Business as usual is this red bar. By the end of the century, we expect two months out of the year to be over 90 degrees Fahrenheit in Boston and Hartford and, and Philly. There was, you can expect about one day before over 100 degrees Fahrenheit, but up to 30 days over 100, 100 degrees is really hot. That's like the heat wave that they experienced in Russia. In Russia, they, they were absolutely not ready for it. Hardly anybody at home an air conditioner in Russia because under average weather conditions, Okay, so, so, so I've, I've gotten a little bit scary here, right? Uh, the Canadians are going to take all our maple syrup. That's, that's pretty scary. Um, this is pretty scary. Extreme heat waves, flooding, drought. This is all scary. But so, so what can we do? What can we do about it? Um, in order to have any chance of preventing these things that I've talked about from happening, we need an 80 to 90% reduction in per capita greenhouse gas emission by 2050. When this, this statement is actually a relatively old statement. This statement uh, you can find in reports about global warming in 2000. They said by 2050 we need an 80 to 90 percent reduction in carbon emission. <clears throat> we haven't started yet. In 2000 this was 50 years away. Now it's 39 years away. Uh, so, so we're going to have to work really hard. But that doesn't mean that we're going to need to invent crazy new technologies. We can in fact do all of this right now with technology that we have right now. Um, so this is a chart from the McKinsey Consulting Firm that they produced uh, a couple of years ago. And it shows the cost or profit to be expected from various, doing various things, and how much carbon emission, how much, how much greenhouse gas emission reduction they will cause. All of the things down here cost nothing. In fact, they make a profit for whoever does them. All of the things over here have some cost, and the cost increases as you move this way. The fact that we haven't done these things because these, these, are, these are all things that McKinsey said we can do. The fact that we haven't done these things is what's called a massive market failure. Uh, insulating your house costs you money now, but it'll save you money in the future. And we just, we haven't done enough of that. Uh, improved waste recycling, or all, having all the cars be full hybrid cars. These will have dramatic negative costs. Right? They're, they're, not, they're not only free, they're better than free. Um, so we should be doing all of these things immediately right now because it's money in the pocket. Uh, we can use that money in the pocket then to pay for some of these other things which cost some. Solar panels right now are still more expensive than burning coal. The cost is dropping drastically. We can, but we can use this money in the pocket to help us do these other things. Uh, and, and a nice conceptual framework for how many of each of these things we need to do is what's called the wedging. It comes from a paper by, by uh, Pakala and Sokolo, who are rich researchers at Princeton in 2004 in science. Uh, here's our current historical emissions path. At the rate that emissions are increasing, that's where we're going. If we want to have any chance of preventing these terrible things from happening, of getting to that 80% 80, 80 emissions reduction, we need to prevent this future increase from happening and start decreasing by the middle of the century significantly. And the way that Paul Sokolow 
conceptualize this is they made these wedges. Each wedge represented one gigaton of carbon emission in 2050. So, so one quantity of carbon emission in, when they wrote the paper, 45 years. Uh, but we haven't done anything in the past six years, so we don't need eight wedges in order to get to that point. We actually need 13 to 15. Well, what's a wedge look like? A wedge is 2,000 gigawatts peak of solar pho photovoltaics. That is 700 times our current capacity of solar. But that doesn't require new solar panels. That's the same solar panels that we have now. We just have to build more. We can build more. And the more we build, the cheaper they'll get. Uh, another example of a wedge is much more efficient buildings. We can build buildings that are effectively carbon neutral if we insulate them better, if we put insulation in the attics, if we make efficient heat exchangers. And people are doing this. There are companies in Germany, you can call them up and say, I want to build a house that I don't have to heat in the winter. And th there, there's actually someone in Minneapolis right now, Minneapolis, where it gets really cold, come from there, uh, who has changed his house so that they can heat the, the entire house with one space heater. Pretty amazing. And that's something that, that again, that's money in the pocket. Um, so these things are all hard, but we can do all of them. We don't need to build a fancy fusion plant. We can do all of these things. Uh, we just have to start now. And so, and, and so that's, that's, the, that's the, uh, the last point I want to make. Greenhouse gases warm the planet. That's good. Otherwise, it would freeze. But too many greenhouse gases warm the planet too much. And so we have droughts and floods and snow again. Uh, we can prevent all of those terrible things from happening if we start working right now. But we have to start now. It's possible, but it's hard. And so I'll leave you with a couple of resources if you want to read up some more on this. Uh, Yale has a nice website called Yale Environment 360, e360.yale.org, where they report on various aspects of, of climate science in the literature, on how the media reports on climate science. One of my favorite websites is realclimate.org. Uh, it's, a, it's a blog run by a, uh, about a dozen different climate scientists reporting on their research and other research. Um, so it's climate science by climate scientists. Uh, and skepticalscience.org was, um, was written by someone who uh, about, about 10 years ago didn't, wasn't really sure about all of this global warming climate change thing. And so he went and started reading, reading papers and studying up on it. And he, he, he made a web page to keep track of all of the things that he heard, all of the myths that he heard about global warming and climate change, and what was wrong with them. Uh, and probably about half of the slides in this talk come from skeptical science. They're, they make a, a lot of wonderful, wonderful images and, and graphs to break all this down. Uh, and so with that, I'll leave you with these and, and write them down, and I'll take questions. How bad is it going to 
get in a given location well, is really hard to answer. Globally, by 2050, um, given sea level rise and flooding and such, uh, the, the sort of typical prediction is that there will be about 400 million people who are displaced from where they live due to either flooding or climate change, or, or flooding or droughts or increased sea level rise. The Maldives will be gone by 2050. Um, probably the Arctic ice cap will be completely gone in the summer by 2020. Probably. Maybe even sooner than that. It's actually, uh, well, if you want to know how bad things can get. I didn't want to scare people too much, but So this is uh, observed Arctic sea ice extent versus the projections. So this is the, the, the best projections of what the sea ice would do from the fourth IPCC report. Uh, this is what it's actually doing. It's, we're, we're losing Arctic ice much faster than predicted. Uh, in fact, the Northwest Passage opened last year, the Northeast Passage I think opened this year, um, and uh, companies like BP and Maersk, the big shipping companies, are already figuring out how they can exploit this to ship things cheaper. Uh, BP is is figuring BP and Exxon and uh, uh, what's the other one? Uh, no, Phillips are trying to figure out how they can drill for ice in place, uh, drill for ice, drill for oil in the Arctic, where it used to be covered in ice because it's not going to be covered in ice. Um, so, the problem is, oh, and I mean, I, this isn't the only one where things are getting bad, as bad as we expected. Sea level rise is happening at the top level of the projections. Um, the IPCC projections were actually probably conservative by at least a factor of two, if not a factor of four. So by 2050, we might have two feet of sea, a foot or two feet of sea level rise. And that's enough to wipe out the Maldives. Um, so, so, from the standpoint of how bad can it get, uh, it can get pretty bad in 40 years. But if we don't do anything, it might be pretty bad in 40 years. It's guaranteed to be terrible in, uh, in 100 years. Um, so, but but you know, some, of these, some of these effects, like the maple syrup production, we're, we're just starting to see that now. We're about 100 meters up here with the observatories. Yeah, my, my <laughs> house is at 7 meters. So 7 meters? Well. But, but actually, I was reading one of the things. The Northeast, um, uh, Connecticut, Massachusetts um, are expected to have a little bit higher sea level rise than the, than the global average due to changing, uh, changing land patterns and what's called isostatic rebound as, as when water is heavy. So as water changes, the level of the Changes. So actually, the northeast will probably have a bit more sea level rise. Um, the water table is related to that too. Yeah. Um, so, like Amnesset Park, if you've ever been there, a lovely place. Um, Amnesset Swamp. Amnesset Swamp. Um, and and I mean, I, really, yeah, Amnesset Marine Park. Yes. Uh, so so that's that's how bad. If, 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 things, if things keep going the way they're going, it could get pretty bad by 2050. There's the possibility for it getting incredibly bad by 2050 if um, uh, what are called methane plethrates. So there, there's methane trapped in the ground, methane trapped in the permafrost in, in Canada, in Alaska, in Siberia. As that warms up, that methane is released. Methane is a greenhouse gas. Uh, on a, in a warmer planet, you get methane coming out of what used to be permafrost, but it's no longer perma and no longer frost. Uh, and that will, that's a positive feedback that will warm the planet even more. That's, that's why, if you, if you look at paleoclimatology, the study of Earth's climate over, over history, um, you can have huge swings in temperature. And they're kicked off by, say, the sun increases the amount of light that it's putting out by a half a percent. Well, that warms the planet a little bit, that melts the ice, that makes kind of absorb a little bit more, so it warms up a little bit more, so that methane is released, so that it warms up even more. But we don't know at what level we 
have to get to for those things to kick in. They might kick in soon, they might not kick in for a while. Um, we know that if we stopped, if we shut down civilization tomorrow, I'm not advocating this, <laughs> but if we shut down civilization tomorrow, we'd still have another at least half a degree of warming in the pipeline because it takes time for the system to get it. That's something about your wedges there. Your wedges are decreases in emission not decreases in CO2. Absolutely. Uh, so, so it's going up, 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 up. It's just going up at a slower rate if those wedges. It, well, well, or preferably it's not going up anymore at all. Um, if, if, we do, if we do the wedges, we, we fix the amount that we're emitting, not, not the total amount in the atmosphere. So we'll continue to emit more, we just won't emit more anymore. Um, this is, you, you want to talk about the pressing. Uh, the black line, like I was, I was saying, Heidi, you know, I could talk about this for ten, I could give a ten-hour talk. Uh, we'll uh, but this is, huh? We'll cut you off today. Yeah, this is in response to a question. <laughs> uh, the black line is how much CO2 emissions per year. So this is not total amount of the atmosphere. This is the amount per year. Um, these different curves are different projections from the IPCC, so they have, when they make a climate model, they have to assume a certain amount of fossil fuel burning in order to predict what's going to happen in the future. So they made a bunch of different prediction, projections. B2 is the optimistic one. That's the one where we get greenhouse gases under control by 2020 and we start a strong reduction um, by 2020. Uh, A2 and A1FI, A1FI is called fossil fuel intensive, and A2 uh, is the, the third world, the developing countries develop very strongly and, and you know, increase their economies very strongly as they're doing right now. Um, and A, A2 and A1FI are, are the highest IPCC projections of greenhouse gas emissions. We are running at the highest level. This dip, anyone know what, what caused that dip? The recession. The only time that there, in the past two, two decades, that there has been any significant decrease in the amount of greenhouse gases we're putting into the atmosphere was when we had a global recession. I don't want a global recession. <laughs> um, but this is not very heartening. Uh, and the more time we spend up here, the faster we have to cut down. Because what matters is the total amount in the atmosphere, not how much we're getting today. Does that answer your question? Um, but like I said, like I said, right, I gave a list of things we can do right now today, and it's hard. Um, it's been likened to doing the Manhattan Project all over again for every one of those industries. But we can do it. We don't need to advance with great magical technology. I noticed that on the side Even 
though they have a big payoff. Oh, because it costs money to do those things early on. I'm not familiar with campus So so this one, uh, this is in steel production, I believe. Um, I don't know the I don't know the details of this one, but this is this is changing how you make steel by basically reusing um, reusing ash from Um, well, with Michael, can you go back to the Ice Age? Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, we, 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 we like the Ice Age. Uh, uh, this one? Did you have the same question that I had? Yeah, this one? well, go, I, go ahead. This one? I, yeah, go, go ahead. Yeah, that's the one. My question there was uh, you uh, said that uh, the Ice Age correlates with CO2. Yep. But which one is causing which? Both. Well, okay. They're causing each other. So so I don't have. I don't have. A, a plot here of the temperatures during the ice ages, um, but it, but at the bottom of the ice age, the temperature was about th two to three degrees colder than it is now. Um, at the at the very at the bottom of the coldest ice ages, it was like four four and a half degrees colder than it is now. Um, so at the bottom of this ice age cycle, uh, what happens here is the Earth, as it goes around the sun changes its distance from the sun, changes its inclination, um, so sunlight hits different parts of the Earth, and those changes happen over tens of thousands of years. And as those, those changes happen, and as the sun changes the amount of light that it produces, you get a little bit of a push, either a little bit warmer or a little bit colder, and these feedbacks kick in. Methane gets released from permafrost or gets trapped in permafrost when the permafrost gets really cold. Um, ice when ice melts, ice is more reflective than water, so, so it prevents heat from being absorbed. So as ice melts, more heat can be absorbed by the water than otherwise would be. Um, so what happens is you get a little bit of a kick, say at the bottom of the ice age. The sun increases its output a little bit, the Earth's orbit shifts just enough so that we warm up a little bit, and then these feedback effects kick in, which increase the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere, which make it even warmer than it would have. So, so uh, the, the phrase I like about this is that CO2 and carbon dioxide is both a forcing, it makes a change happen, and a feedback. It is affected by a change. Yeah, I was going to say, I didn't think Neanderthals uh, were going to go over driving SUVs. And points and points. Um, it's true. But, but you know, cl climate has changed in the past. Does that come from the ocean, the CO2 up and down? Does it come from the ocean? Uh, it, it, so, so a, a warmer atmosphere means the ocean will release more CO2. A colder atmosphere means the ocean will hold on to more CO2. So again, that, that's one of those feedbacks. And it doesn't, you know, it doesn't take much of a kick. And these changes happen over thousands of years. We're changing it over decades. Okay, well that was my question. How do you your Um, well in addition to that, um, does this take into account the amount of life and the type of life that's on Earth? Say again? Does this graph take into account the amount of life and the type of life on Earth? Well, so this is just a graph of the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. That, that's all that this, is, this represents. During the ice ages, there were different things alive. Absolutely. Um, when, when all of Canada is covered by a glacier, you can't really grow much there. Uh, but um, uh, as the, the, and as the ice sheets retreat, more plants start changing the carbon cycle, um, and how you know how the, the whole Earth system responds to those little changes in, say, how our orbit shifts, is affected by plants and animals and plankton and such. Um, but that's that's mostly a feedback. Does that does that answer your question? Yeah, kind of. Um, so where's this data from? Is this from so, the so this is from this is mostly from the Vostok ice core in Antarctica. So so uh, when when there's a lot of ice in that in, in Antarctica, miles, um, right. and that ice it, it snows. Antarctica is actually kind of a desert. They, they really don't get very much precipitation there. But when they get some, it doesn't melt because it's so cold. So they get a little bit of snow, and then they get a little bit of snow on top of that. On top of that, and that packs down to make really thick ice. Uh, and that ice 
traps CO2 that was in the snow when it fell. And so we drill, the further down we drill into the ice, the further back in time we can study how much CO2 is in the atmosphere. So this is actually, this is actually pretty, a pretty direct measurement. We find bubbles of air in ice and measure the amount of CO2. There are caveats to it. You can go talk with the people who study paleoclimate here at Yale about that. I, I don't do a lot of paleoclimate, so I can't talk to the details of this. Um, getting the temperature of the past right, right? So, so, so we didn't have thermometers back in 1200, but we can do things like measure the ratios of isotopes and measure uh, tree rings. Tree rings are the big thing for reconstructing temperatures over a thousand years or so. Um, when it's warmer, trees will grow faster than when it's colder, so the, the, the rings are a little bit bigger, and you can actually get a pretty good reconstruction of past temperatures from them. It looks like a hockey stick. It is a hockey stick, huh? There's hockey sticks as far as the eye can see. <laughs> All right, well, there's a fantastic talk. Uh, thanks to all of you for coming out through the weird weather that we have tonight. Yeah, oh, I, did, did I even mention that today was perfect for this? The 60 degrees and raining in December? <laughs> perfect for this talk. <laughs> so we're going to have a white Christmas? I have no idea. Okay, like I said, regional climate modeling is really hard. Three feet oh, of snow. Yeah. So, so if uh, the Arctic, you know, really completely melts, uh, tell us what happens with Santa Claus. What's the story? Yeah. There? I'm going to defer that one to the future talk. <laughs> yeah, okay, so, so I didn't include it, but um, uh, I, I, I feel like, I didn't know where to include it, but I feel like every climate science oh, talk yeah. needs to include an obligatory It's so <laughs> sad. <laughs> Let me on. Well, I, it's, 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 I'm, not, I'm not sure what to, whether this picture is him like trying to prevent the inevitable, yeah. or if he's trying, or if he's like, oh, it looks tasty up there. <laughs> um, but this is the this is your obligatory. Point.